Um, so I'll call the meeting to order. And let's go through some of the action items. Okay. So, where should we start? Meeting minutes is always easy. Sounds good to me. <laughs> okay. Uh, does anyone have any comments or suggestions for the meeting minutes? Look good. Uh, any more? No? Okay. Seeing that there's no comments, as always, thank you very much for getting it done on a timely basis. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion that we approve the meeting minutes for May 7th. Uh, second. Uh, all those in favor? All set. Okay. Okay. So, action items. So, this is the uh, Chapter 61. Um, yep. At the last meeting, we talked about this. Um, what was the dis um, So you guys had left me with a couple questions to okay. see if it was in the open space plan and to see if any other departments had any interest. So it is not flagged in the current um, draft of the open space plan that the town's working on. Okay. And it has gone before recreation assessors and planning, and none of them have any interest. Okay. Is there any reason... That we should okay I know we looked at it last time uh, so will you uh, prepare a letter and mm -hmm. and send it over to let them know that yep we do not see any uh, interest in this Just need a vote uh, sure do I have a motion uh, what would the motion be for? <laughs> so <laughs> the motion would be for um, uh, to uh, indicate new interest in oh, yeah that okay. one I'll motion to indicate no interest in the uh, land at 43 and 44 Westbrook. Cool. I'll second that. All those in favor? Okay. I was about to ask the same question. <laughs> <laughs> what do you, what do you, yeah. We're all a little, a little punchy tonight here, so <coughs> keep it going. Um, discussion items for uh, the drainage issues on Adams Road. So we have a little bit um, of an update so that. Uh, you had, I don't know, Leah, if you want to just fill us in. Um, sure. So I, after our last meeting, I think it was the last one, um, we decided we'd send a memo to DPW um, to get their side of what's been going on out there with their road improvement project. Um, so I did send that memo to Paul Knoyer, uh, DPW director, asked for a written response and for him to attend our next meeting, which is tonight. Uh, he's unavailable tonight. He can come in June. Um, okay. And I, he did not write back a written response in the okay. meantime. Okay. And so he did, um, he responded to Leah and, and, and offered that he'd be, because he couldn't make it tonight, that he'd, he could talk with us or talk to me. I would just rather do that in a public hearing. I don't need to be the messenger and get have a perception that the town's kind of, you know, keeping in the background. I think it, uh, our kind of our concerns of this is pretty straightforward. So it's just an opportunity to come at the next meeting. And um, Leah also uh, reached out to uh, the abutter that yep. in what did she? Um, so she, um, I let her know that we were going to be revisiting this June 18 to keep it um, in the public meeting setting yeah. and I told her she was still welcome to come tonight yep. if she wanted um, I don't think she is okay which is fine we just wanted to make sure we do it in a, in a public setting so we can have that conversation okay all right uh, other action items I actually have one more okay uh, let me just pull it up so national grid um, sent me an email that they, we had issued them a negative RDA for some of the work they need to do, um, which I have right here. Um, so it's for them putting, uh, installing conduit on Waterville, Pine, Willard, and Westboro, if you guys remember that, back yep. in March. So one of the conditions we had put on that was um, that they will give us a plan to show the laydown area and if they need to uh, apply for formal approval. So they emailed me um, that they've picked their laydown area. Okay. Which 
uh, it's near Tufts or maybe within Tufts, I'm not sure. Discovery Drive is right here. Okay, that's going up to the, the yeah, okay, yep. This is existing stuff that they already store there. Um, okay. I'm not sure if that's from Grid or from Tufts. They also sent me a picture. Um, so. Yeah, that, it, that's on the way up the hill. They did say that there's um, wetlands to the west. Yep. So they feel like it falls within the buffer zone. Um, oh, really? Okay. I mean, when you turn wetlands on on MapGeo, it's further than 100 feet away, but that's just an estimate. Yep. So this was the area they had put in the photo. Okay. Uh, that's the closest wetland that our GIS system picks up on. Yep. So I just didn't know if anything further was required or if this just becomes part of that file. I think it becomes a, a part of that file. The only thing I would say is when you have an opportunity um, is just to take a ride out there and just see. I, I think it's fairly clear because that's, I know the area a little bit. But okay. just to double check, but I don't think that's a big rush, especially based on the GIS. Is that connected to the substation, or is that this because of the substation that's going in? I'm not sure. Okay. All right. Yeah, just a question. Mm -hmm. Just because I walk by the substation all the time. Yeah. I did not realize how involved that was. It's coming along. Yes. Yep. They're actually very good at sending in their inspection reports. That's fabulous to hear. Well, usually they do have compliance folks that are pretty good about making yeah. sure that's all done. Yep. Okay. Anything else as far as action items? That's all I have. Um, I'll just give an update of um, just going through the interview process for agent, uh, not in the middle of it, so no update. Um, I'm not doing any hiring, so. But it's just more of an FYI that we've interviewed three people and have one left. So, what's the deadline for hiring? Uh, there is no deadline. So it's just ASAP. <laughs> yeah, it, it's really <coughs> going to be based on um, the process and discussions afterwards. I don't think it's. Um, I don't think there's going to be any kind of hold up to that. We'll see. Um, Anything else as far as action items? No, I'm just getting ready for the next thing okay. <laughs> in the background. <laughs> yep, no, no problem. So we have to wait seven minutes. Um, if you guys want to take a look in the meantime, we had one more comment come in uh, this afternoon from the abutter at 51 Church Street oh, okay. um, for Brigati Village. Yep. Um, the applicant's aware of it, and they're going to talk about it tonight. It is in Dropbox for you. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. Or, I'll, I won't ask any questions until we're, yeah. Sure. All right. Dropbox. What's the name of it? Um, if you can sort by date, it would be right on top. Uh, second public comment from 51 Church Street.
Did we ever get the uh, the additional um, geotechnical information? Yep, okay. and I did send him the link okay. today in response to his comment. I know one thing we could discuss I just thought of. Yep. Um, your feelings on waiver requests in the RDA process. An example being the project we're gonna be looking at in a minute is on the beach. Okay. Um, it's an RDA for some uh, utility upgrades. But being that it's right on the beach, I had them do a waiver request for the 25 yep. foot no disturb. I just didn't know, do waiver requests belong in an RDA? Then you're so, adding a fee onto it. So because it's under the local bylaw, and to be quite honest, I'd have to actually read the, that specific sections. Okay. Um, I would think like most things that we do, it probably depends upon the project. Okay. I would think as rule of thumb that if they're asking for a waiver mm -hmm. for like, they were doing permanent improvements above ground or something, that would need some sort of process, not just an RDA, but where it's, you know, utility improvements. Yeah. I don't know. We'll have to talk about that. Yeah. But the most common one is the 25-foot no disturb. Right. On RDAs. Yep. Usually like a homeowner. Right. And, and, and I think it's it's a case-by-case -case thing. Mm -hmm. Is it already altered? Is it, you know, what's, yeah. what's the conditions? <laughs> Are you making it worse? You know, those are all those typical considerations. Right. It's a good question. Uh, I'm just never sure if they should fill it out. Because the RDA is so preliminary. Yeah. I would say filling it out is not a bad idea, just yeah. to have it documented. Okay. But it's just that there's a fee, too. Oh, okay. So an RDA is usually 25. A waiver request is 50. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, it's, I think it's, um, it'd be worth looking at um, the actual bylaw and actually reading the fine print, so to speak, of during the uh, administrative process. Okay. And, I, and, I, and to be quite honest, I bet you it's not even in there. There's no clear, it's not something that, you know. I think our language on waivers is pretty vague, but I'll take a look. I think it's that way on purpose because it's such a case-by-case -case basis and that you should really be making those cases a decision based on those unique circumstances as opposed to having general kind of guidelines. Okay. So you may have kind of the way you, you typically do things, but it should be always on a case-by-case, -case, which is why which maintains the whole ability to give a waiver because it's unique. And that if you, you know, so that someone can't come in and say, well, you've given 10 of these waivers, I can have it. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's case by case. Okay. So that's kind of, that's the way I would look at it and, and, and should be probably maintained. But I think it's a good question as far as procedure wise and just double checking that. Okay. Seeing that it's 7.15. Okay. Pursuant to the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act and the Grafton Wetlands Protection Bylaw, Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing um, to act upon a request for determination of applicability for electrical service upgrades at 245 Upton Street. If that is your project, come on up. Uh, just give you a name and then uh, let's uh, and a short description of what you're doing. Sure, John Anderson, Recreation Director. Um, I don't have the specific language in front of me that I filled it on the RDA or how much history you want to know, but basically um, 
with the capital upgrades that we did last year, I mean, we worked with an electrician to stay within our amperage for this new equipment, um, but we did lose power a few times and ended up with significant food loss. So let alone we need to increase our power for our current level, um, for our immediate needs, we're, we're trying to add a larger oven and hopefully some portable AC to that to that boathouse down there. But um, so with this upgrade, um, besides just what our electrician can do, involves national grid. So a um, couple things we've had to do. One is there's been no um, legal easement for, for them. Um, so they really want to go forward, make sure that they have those things. So uh, we did, because of the timing on it, we weren't able to get the easement on this town meeting. So the selectman did signed, uh, sign a license agreement. So I have a copy of that. So BOS has a license agreement in October. We'll get the official easement. Um, but between the approval of this and um, and they'll have a license agreement, National Grid would move forward with that. So they need to replace the pole um, that is right near the boathouse, um, which is, is it like 15 feet? Um, put in there? You put 13 in the application. From the edge of the water. Um, so it's old, it's not up to code, um, it was never anchored. Um, so there's a couple things that they now want to take on doing that. Um, and so although we currently have um, the electricity running from the boathouse um, to the building underground um, they also it's a they want to is it the overhead what are we doing I know we are trenching we're trying to trench from that pole to the other side of the building so we go out to the left around the showers that we, that we put in um, to the back of the building there um, yeah, they're going to remove the existing overhead service. Um, we wanted to trench it on the ground. So the main feed would be going to the boathouse there um, with it split over to the, running over to the snack bar there. Um, so there's some cost that um, National Grid will be absorbing because it's a service improvement. And then there's costs that we will have to incur, um, which I have as part of that capital money slash our maintenance budget as well. So. Um, they wanted, um, because the work is in these jurisdictional, jurisdictional resource areas, um, they wanted to get a permit. If the permit wasn't required, they wanted some form of approval from you that right. they could go forward with the project. Which the REA is uh, appropriate. So the reason for the easement is because of the pole. Okay. And, and um, do you have an idea of how deep the, the lines need to be? I don't. I know what it usually is, but this is sand, so it's. A, I, I, I'm. <laughs> it's more just a question about how deep they have to dig it, because usually it's not that deep. Right. Uh, it's usually maybe 30, 36 inches deep, but I don't know with the sand if they go a little bit deeper. I just don't know the answer to that. Um, yeah. So I mean, National Grid will be doing the pole, but our electrician and DPW will be trenching. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. For the the running of it. Okay. So where's the new pole going? It's. They're replacing that. They Just want to replace the that spot. pole there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Any other questions from the commission? Uh, any uh, questions from the uh, public on this particular project? Okay. Where does the wire come from to that pole? Like where on the road? Across the. Is it over the water? Uh, it's like or right it from there straight, straight up to down. the yeah okay. the road. I don't remember being there. So, so one thing that we should do first of all is to uh, basically approve uh, the waiver uh, for work within the um, no disturb, and I think you know the the finding on that is really it's an existing service that is being improved, mm -hmm. i.e. the pole, and then um, providing underground services to the building is probably a, a safety improvement, but it's also being dictated by the national grid okay so yeah and and they have their own reasons for doing that and there's probably a combination of things right um, so the first thing would be just to have a motion for the waiver and then uh, we got the finding on why we would yep. approve it so do I have a, a, a motion sure. I'll, I'll motion to grant the waiver to allow work within the no disturb I'll second and all those in favor so that's step one. 
So the second step is to, um, uh, and you understand that a negative determination is what you're looking for, okay. Just double checking, just so. Um, and then uh, as far as um, uh, kind of conditions, recommendations that we would have are pretty standard that you would have uh, erosion control barriers. Um, you have a little bit of advantage that it's sand, but it's, it's still, uh, we'd want to see erosion control barriers. Um, you may not have any soil, excess soil, but if you do, you need to uh, dispose of it properly, which basically means uh, either offsite or outside of the 100 foot buffer, which you don't have a whole lot of room. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then uh, the other one is trenches shall be backfilled at the end of each day, which from a safety perspective, you're probably doing, but we want it just so that they don't fill up with water and we have other issues going on. Any other conditions that anyone can think of? Any issues with, the, with these type of uh, standard conditions? No, I, I um, you know, we were anticipating, the hope was that we were going to have this done for the summer, but with all the steps in National Grid and their steps, it probably won't happen in the fall. So okay. um, they'll have plenty of time to do whatever they need to do okay. <laughs> without yeah. disturbing any. Uh, what date's the lake opening? June 15th. Okay. Does this include like a heater for the water? <laughs> for the water? <laughs> the water is like, the water is oh, 61 the other day. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get in yet. <laughs> Okay, um, so do I have uh, a motion uh, to issue a negative determination with the conditions we discussed? Uh, a motion to issue a negative determination with the following special conditions, erosion control barrier, excess soil material should be disposed off site and trenches shall be backfilled at the end of each work day. I'll second that. Uh, all those in favor? Good luck. All right, thank you. Mm. So this is the best thing about how we changed our meetings where we can do continuations whenever we want. So we're gonna hang out for a couple hours? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Okay, um, pursuant to the Massachusetts Wellness Protection Act and the Grafton Wellness Protection Bylaw, Grafton Stormwater Management Bylaw, Conservation Commission, Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing to act upon a notice of intent, application for Grafton Wetlands Protection Bylaw Permit, and application for Grafton Wetlands uh, Stormwater Management Bylaw Permit um, for the construction of a 57 unit multifamily um, at 41 Church Street and 14 West Street. Please come on up. Uh, you know um, the process, uh, please give your name and updates and let's uh, keep on going here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Wayne Bellick, uh, WDA Design Group. I'm joined by Dave Brassi of uh, Brigati Village LLC, the project proponent. Uh, so since we last met, we have submitted plans, revised plans to uh, Graves Engineering for their peer review, the commission and the planning board have uh, a set of the revised plan. We've also uh, issued a response letter to the, uh, the peer review of Graves Engineering, uh, of Ecotech, uh, MDM, the traffic consultant, so obviously that's planning board related. Uh, we also included some of the comments raised by both the commission and the planning board and uh, how we address those specific comments. Um, so, Madam Chair, however you'd like to to address that, if you want to go through the letter or just a general overview of what we've done, I think we've kind of covered it over the last couple of weeks. Why don't we can, do Why don't we do a general overview first, yeah. and then if we have specific questions, we can get into the more details. Sure. Um, if you could, Leah, go to the. I didn't bring my pointer tonight, so I'm at a disadvantage. We could go to the. Uh, Your letter. Nope. Did you want your letter? Well, did, did you want to go through the letter or you want me to just use the plans, Madam Chair? So why don't you go general overview right. and then if we have specific questions on the letters, we'll get into that. Exactly I'll, what you I'll said have about a, a minute ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just okay. start one place and yep. then let's so, go to the detail when we need so to. So basically uh, the changes entailed revising some of the uh, uh, call outs that we had, some of the um, conflicts in the information between the HydroCAD model and the plans. Uh, then we had uh, made some changes to the plans, which uh, included uh, incorporating some of the comments uh, raised by the commission, as I said at the last meeting with the phase lines and uh, the, 
limit of work. Uh, with respect to Graves Engineering, uh, they did have some questions on a couple of things. There was one, if we could go out to the uh, uh, grading and drainage plan, Leah. At the northern edge of the property line, we have a, a, a subsurface detention system. <clears throat> and they were a little unclear as to what was uh, being proposed and whether or not we were directly discharging to the garage just north of that property line. Uh, what we had done is on the, one of the detail sheets, we had uh, provided a detail, a blow up of that area to show that there is a level spread, a down gradient of the retaining wall that we're proposing in there. If I could just scoot up here for a second. Sure. So what we're proposing is, as we uh, mentioned to the, the board at one point, there are some retaining, uh, some uh, farmer's walls within the site. What we're proposing is to take one of the farmer, farmer's walls and reconstruct it out along this property line, just inside the property line. And down gradient of that, we would have uh, a minor excavation in here so that along the property line it would be slightly elevated by about, a, let's say, a half foot or so. So those elevations along the property line will be at about 450 and a half. We have a 450 up against the... Uh, the base of uh, the wall. And then in this area here, we are proposing, like I said, the freestanding farmer's wall. So from that side, from a northerly project looking, uh, or the northerly site looking in, basically what you're going to see is what is typical of a, a property line in this area, uh, a farmer's wall. So basically what happens is once the system uh, drains, it'll drain into this low-lying area in here, which will then uh, gradually fill up in sheet flow over the top uh, of the berm through the, the breaks in the wall uh, along the, the, uh, the property line. So we do have a detail if you want to scoot to the detail sheets. Not exactly sure, Leah, which one that is. Uh, but we have a, a blow up of that and I, I provided a cross section as well. Keep going. I'm guessing it's probably toward the end of the detail sheets. Ah, here we are. So basically, like I said, this is a, a blow up of that area. This is, if you look at it in section, here is uh, the, rec the portion of that uh, stormwater system that comes out through a, a drain pipe that spills onto a riprap pad. And then, like I said, this area will surcharge in here and then slowly reach through the uh, leach through the wall. Uh, so that's basically what they were looking for was a, a blow up to that as it was uh, a little unclear to them as to what we were trying to propose there. What's going into that basin? Uh, we have up gradient of the basin. Uh, if you could, Leah, go back to the grading and drainage. So everything that gets to it goes through a stormwater treatment unit do you want me to zoom more? If you could, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So basically, we have the, wa the local watershed through here collected in the st uh, storm drain system, goes to a, a treatment unit in here, and then eventually into the, uh, the system. And the roof drains go same place? Uh, yeah, they will, they'll just basically discharge onto the ground. So that's, they're disconnected? That's correct. Okay. So, And it's just that quadrant of that? parcel right there. That's correct. Okay. Yep. Okay. The, uh, the other thing that uh, we had done was what has become my baby, which is that <laughs> gravel wetland. <laughs> um, and I was, I was thrilled to do this. In fact, I was in to, to drop off some plans um, yesterday to Leah and uh, it was a real, I was in geek mode, uh, I must say, as I was talking about it. Uh, but in any event, we did have uh, the other comp. Those are basically, I mean, other comments that they raised were um, some of the leaders that we showed on the plan needed to get adjusted because they were no longer valid. They did have a, uh, a concern, if we could, Leah, go down to the stormwater basin here. So the discharge um, at one point they were concerned because the velocity in that pipe was crazy. It was like at 22 feet per second. For, which, for which storm? 
Uh, I'm not exactly sure, but I know it was at 22 feet per second. So what I told the, uh, the engineer, I said, I, I want to run this so that we're less than 10 feet per second. So basically what that required was stepped uh, drain manholes along the route. So we have it at less than 10 feet per second. How much are the drops? Uh, that's a good question. I think uh, we could go to the, uh, if we go out to the plan and profile, perhaps we might see something in those pipe numbers. Yeah, and I'm just looking for yeah. like general. General uh, ideas? Yeah. Uh, maybe four, five, six feet. Okay. All right. And you just get a sense of just how much Great mitigating. Changing. Yeah. Yep. That's all. Uh, the other thing they brought up was, I mean, they really didn't have a whole heck of a lot. I mean, the, and again, the other thing that came from this was my my baby. Yeah. Um, so we could do uh, a couple things. We could go out to, if we could go to a detail sheet, Leah. Uh, let's see, it's probably going to be near the last of the detail sheets. Oh, give me up. So here is a blow up of the basin. So the spur drive comes up through here, stormwater is collected, uh, discharges uh, to this location here and out. There is a uh, stormwater treatment unit up at the driveway. There's another stormwater treatment unit uh, back here at the end unit on the left at the uh, T turnaround for a fire apparatus. So, and as we also have a uh, stormwater treatment unit up in here as well. So, what we've done is we've discharged, we've collected this as we originally had uh, discharged into this portion of the basin, which is, remains uh, an infiltration basin. And then we've taken uh, the runoff from here uh, and discharged it into this area. Now, the volume that we're looking at, the water quality volume that I've sized these for, so as, as you know, Madam Chair, these proprietary units uh, can take that 10%. They can easily handle that 10% water quality volume. So we've got that uh, addressed by the proprietary units and the 45% split up in, in each of the cells. Uh, basically, uh, it discharges into here. I've got this pipe discharges at about a, just shy of a 464, maybe at a 464, and then it comes up to a 466 in, in its riprap looking to dissipate some of that energy as it comes through here, uh, although that pipe is still fairly flat. And then it will just breach over the, uh, the top into um, the, uh, the first cell of the, uh, of the gravel wetland. Uh, so if we could, Leah, scroll down to the cross section, I can basically show you what's happening. So that first uh, inlet that I, I called out up above that goes into the infiltration bas basin discharges into this area in here. As you noticed in the plan view, the basin narrows at one point and then opens up again. That narrowing occurs uh, right in here. Then goes down to the, uh, the infiltration basin, which uh, includes the uh, 24 inches of 3 quarter inch crushed stone, the 3 inches of pea stone uh, over, the 8 inch wetland soil mix, and uh, the uh, plant material above it. Uh, these uh, systems are equipped with uh, perforated riser pipes and uh, horizontal perforated pipes and uh, I think it's in this location which shown in the plan view. This location, these are perforated risers, perforated horizontal, this is a solid horizontal uh, in here. And so the way this works, I know Madam Chair, you know these things pretty well, uh, but my understanding is that as it fills up in here, the, the water is going to get to about this elevation in here as we've set the, this elevation here, but aware inside the outlet control device at four inches below the, uh, the finish grade outside the basin. So that this whole area in here, as this flows into this section in here, all this will come up to, to this elevation and water will remain in here to keep the plant's feet wet. Um, and then the, the, the stage storage in this area here will be typical of any uh, stormwater basin for the, uh, the storm events. The, uh, the outlet pipe designed for the 100-year storm event is here, so once everything uh, comes through, uh, 
at the various storm events. Uh, it just cascades over here and then works its way uh, down to the resource area. Yeah, so it's, it's, ba it's basically a horizontal filter. So the whole idea is that you have flow not vertically through it, but horizontally through it because of the way the perforated pipes are. It's that length of horizontal flow that does the treatment. So I have one question. Why are you putting a, a proprietary water quality unit up above this one? Well, we, we had it originally designed that way uh, before we even got to this. Yep. So I guess we're, we've got extra, extra treatment. Yes, you do. I mean, I, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just that, um, and, and again, I'd have to go, I think that's 70% that's or 80%. The uh, gravel wetlands. Ninety. Ninety, yeah. So it depends upon what pollutant that you're talking about. Yep. Uh, but usually you do need pretreatment. Yep. But usually a catch basin sump is, is sufficient. Okay. So just, I mean, I have no problem that if you're adding something up above this particular basin, I don't know if you really need it. Um, I like your that, thinking. I, I like do. Thinking. I take that out of there. <laughs> yeah. What the hell's wrong with you? Is that something <laughs> that we can? Is it is it a no no to remove it, to have? Uh, no, this is it is a water quality um, treatment device. Yep. You know, and it's just nat natural based instead of a proprietary. If you don't, you know, if you don't clean out a proprietary, it will stop functioning. That's right. You don't maintain this, you'll get really just a lot of vegetation. Yep. Um, and it's it's designed in such a way. The reason you need the pre treatment is that you don't clog it. But the way this is designed. It's less likely to clog, and it's not like you got to go in every couple of years and, and you know clean out the stuff from the filter itself. That's what the pretreatment's for. What gets in there is more of the, the, the some of the pollutants and the real fine, and that's fine in a natural system. So the mm -hmm. whole idea of this is this is replaces, is actually replaces the water quality units. Okay. But it's it's nature based as opposed to a, a Man gray. Made. It's green instead of gray. Yep. And that's that's it. So. It'll be interesting. I, I'm not telling you to do one thing one way or the other. Uh, okay. Putting the putting um, in an additional, you know, proprietary system, uh, you know, that's fine. That's not going to hurt anything. Um, but this is the water quality treatment. So um, it does a, a probably a better job with phosphorus and some other hmm. pollutant loads. Um, it, it's like anything else. It's it's that balance that you need to get in a natural system so that it works out really well okay so appreciate that yeah um so i'll be curious i'll be curious to see when it's done because this would be a good example yeah um because once it's all is said it you know this will cost money but it also costs twenty thirty thousand for a series of you know water quality inlets you know it's plus it's from a conservation standpoint and as far as the mechanism instead of a hydro hydrodynamic separator, which relies on velocity, this is actually a mechanical system right. of, and plus the chemical makeup of the wetlands that you're trying to create uh, also provides a lot of other pollutant attenuation. So, yep. yeah. So it's it's there's there's some great reasons from um, from a, a conservation standpoint, and there's also from an engineering standpoint, there's some real flexibilities with this type of system. Mm -hmm because you can get your feet, you want your feet wet on right. this. Right, I do appreciate being introduced to it. I'm looking at another project right now up in Clinton where I'm kicking the tires on doing this as well, just upgrading to the <coughs> pond, so. Yep, and the other thing that you can do is, um, it, it just like you said, the surface above it is just like any other detention basin. So you have the opportunity, depending upon your configuration, to get a pretty good amount of mitigation through that. Mm -hmm. And because you're talking about a hydric soil and you have actually a pipe system to get through you don't have to worry about compaction right right so there's kind of a bunch of things it's it's like everything else is a natural system it takes a little bit more to get it functioning Running. correctly um, but once it gets going it, it's it's pretty um, fairly low maintenance other yep. than the vegetation component of it yep. so. and that's basically a mowing type of yeah I would say you, know, you judge it about the amount of um, UNH has some great guidance on it Every two or three years, you're going to go in and just um, w whatever you want, weed hog or whatever you want to use to get out uh, the overgrown kind of herbaceous, but you also try to um, keep out any woody plants. And that's like the, the main, I main thing that you want to do is try to kind of control that vegetation so it doesn't become ingrown with, with a lot of woody plants because that will alter the, the function of the, uh, of the filter system. So that's really 
the key stuff. So, yeah, like I said, Madam Chair, I much appreciate the introduction yep. to this this okay. BMP. Um, I think in terms of, and then for conservation, uh, that was it. We did, uh, as you are aware, if you wanted to scoot over to Mr. Winston's lot, I can kind of show you what we did over there. Oh, if we, if you want to look at this um, before we scoot over, um, this is the drop inlet that is proposed from Mr. Winston's. Um, as the commission's aware, uh, the current configuration is that 10 inch PVC pipe pretty much right at the ground surface. So if at the top of the pipe, let's say he's got a couple tenths of loam on top of it, yep. um, 10 inches down. This is basically it from the top of the pipe down. So once this puppy fills up, it's all over the place. So what we're proposing is instead of that, as I, as I uh, uh, discussed at the last meeting, um, we've got a drop inlet type of uh, device here. So essentially what's going to happen is the finish grade is going to come up down to the throat of, of the drop inlet. So the water, rather than coming into a circular pipe at this location, it's going to come through uh, a, a drop inlet, an opening, uh, and then go down and make its way out of a 12-inch uh, HDPE pipe at the very bottom. In addition to that, if something gets obstructed here and it begins to surcharge, we have a uh, um, beehive catch basin grate at the top. So if you look at that, uh, Lee, if you want to pan out for a second, or even scroll down, that works. So basically what we have is we have uh, a trash rack right in front of the uh, the throat opening uh, to ensure that nothing gets in there. As I said at the last meeting, I have a, a situation at, at my house where I've got, this culvert's got to be 24 to 36 inches uh, in, and it's, it's a brand new culvert. Uh, and until they put a trash rack up at the head end of this thing, I was getting balls in the wetland out behind my house, all, these, all this junk, bottles and everything. So they wound up putting uh, a trash rack up above, and I no longer get them. My wetland can take off and do its thing, you know. So, but basically the way that works is I've, I've got this to collect any trash that uh, may want to get in there, uh, and then uh, flows through there, and then drops down into the um, into the system and makes its way out. The difference between this system: not only do we have the benefit of the um, going from a 10-inch pipe to a 12-inch pipe, but now we've put more vertical head on it to force it through, okay? Um, so that is that is part of the problem that we have here, that the pipe, even though it appears to be uh, undersized for the, even the more frequent storm events, uh, when we lower that, that invert, it allows us to increase the head on it, which it's able to take more water and, and force more water through that, that pipe. So we've taken a look at it in HydroCAD, and it looks like, that this particular system will, uh, as I said at the last meeting, uh, handle up to that 10-year storm event. Uh, so um, just one quick question, um, which you probably can answer. The, the throat going in, mm -hmm. is that at the same elevation as, as a 10-inch now? That is. Okay. Yeah. That was real, that's, that's it. Um, I don't think there was much more beyond that. So as far as the review letter, definitely, you know, um, scroll, scrolling through this is, you know, it appears that you've gone through and answered a lot of the questions. Now, you've re re replied to this letter with a response letter. Have we gotten anything back from Graves yet? Not yet. No. Okay. All right. And then um, also to let you know, does um, we got uh, a letter from the butter today, uh, follow up on the soils, do you have a copy of that? Of the soils? Of, of no, of uh, the... Of the abutter's letter? Yes. I did read that, um, and I understand that the abutter uh, has uh, expressed more concerns for the exfiltration of those two basins. So what we had done is I had taken a look at that, um, and we have a situation here where as, as we know uh, that with these types of soils, we're going to try to uh, recharge groundwater to the greatest extent practicable. And this is one of the locations uh, where we could do that. Um, with that, uh, 
if we want to recharge groundwater, we we leave it in the in the system. If we if if it becomes, we could go either way. I did have it run through HydroCAD without exfiltration, and it still functions fine. Which again is a testament to this gentleman's uh, position of of how. Now I'm not going to say impermeable, but less permeable than. Uh, 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 an A or B soil uh, is. Uh, so in this case, we can remove that, and the change in the Q is merely hundreds, maybe a tenth, but still below uh, the existing conditions Qs at the property lines for all the events. Yeah, so my kind of concerns is, is to say we need to have the opportunity for recharge, but not relying on it because it's a C soil, correct? Yep. This is all C soil. Agreed. So that's point zero point or seven, two seven, two yeah, seven. that's point two seven. Point two seven. Um, it's pretty seven. good. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's so so the infiltration rate is fairly. Um, it is very low, um, being used. And then what is your drawdown period for the depth that you have? Uh, was within the seventy two hours. I don't think I have the. I'm sure Graves would have reviewed yep. that, so I'm not as worried. But it's just it's meeting a regulatory requirement. Yep. So that's a key component of us of what we want, but also the reality that you're dealing with sea soil. Sea soils are not going to uh, infiltrate any any significant amount of of stormwater. It's it's really not going to do that. Yep. Um, if you have that process where you've gone through and um, you know remove the infiltration. Uh, component of the, the model kind of demonstrates that that's not surprising if you're using 0 0.27 yep you know as an infiltration rate you're not going to get um, you're going to get very little it's really just about um, uh, infiltrating since it's C so it's whatever the, the depth is mm -hmm. for that to mimic the existing so okay no that's that's understandable um, and, and we're going to open it up to the uh, uh, public in a moment so sure um, Anything else, Leah, that we should be specifically talking about um, as far as uh, as far as items that we need to follow up? Like still outstanding items? Yes. Yeah. No. Okay. Because we, we actually voted last week about the no disturb, right? The l last meeting? Uh, no, we haven't taken any votes yet. Okay. I was just wondering if we actually approved that waiver or not. Okay. Um, okay. So, anything? Any other questions from the commission? Um, I have a question on the the first part that we talked about with the the farmer's wall. Can you go back yeah. that real quick? What? So, where's that exist currently? Where's the that existing farmer's wall? Yeah, is that in the relatively same area or? Uh, no, actually, Leah, if you want to go to the existing conditions plan. Yeah. So what we will propose, so there's a... Whoops, sorry. That's no, okay. <laughs> General notes and legend, I was fine with that. Uh, so the existing farmer's wall comes through this area here. There's one that okay. comes through here. Yep. Uh, and then one that comes through here. So right. clearly if we're down, we're not going to be doing anything in this area in your 25 foot no disturb, but right. anything that we're uh, doing in the okay. grading, uh, we have decided that we're going to reuse, repurpose that material. Gotcha. And again, the thought would be is that, you know, those stones that have the moss on it, we'll cast those aside and we'll use those for the top of the wall to make it look yep. like it's been there for a day. Mm -hmm. The trick's going to be is to use a, a natural stone like that and not have gaping holes in it. I, I, and it's, that's a relative term. Yep. So that when you're trying to meter the water through it, mm -hmm. that it, it, it truly meters it through it and not. Water is very lazy yeah, but very is. powerful. Right. And right. it's going to go to that area that. Last re least resistant. You got it. Yep. And so that's probably something that during construction will need attention. Yep. Of monitoring. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, that's, yeah, that's all. So what's on the other side of that wall currently and what will be there? The White Walkers. <laughs> it's over. It's yeah, I know. It's just, you know, life's not going to be the same. <laughs> it's okay. Now we have to speak to one another on Sunday nights. <laughs> I'm only kidding. Uh, so I'm sorry, what's on the other the, side of the wall? So where the wall is going, yeah. the, the proposed spot, yep. 
Yep. And I'm assuming it's north. I'm assuming that yep. map, map's correct. Yeah, if you could go um, right in the drainage. Is this a okay. garage, I believe, that's above that? Yep. So and how and much of a drop is that? Or is it pretty elevation, low? In elevation, it's yeah. fairly, it's not much, probably. So if this is proposed at a 450 in here, mm -hmm. uh, there's a 450 right here that ties into here. So it's not much drop. I mean, it's it's very flat. Okay. Along the property line, it's like a 450 and a half, 451. Uh, here's, actually, here's a 450 right here. That's where it is. I'm sorry. Okay. 450 right here. And then that property, you guys end up purchasing that property too? Or no. 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 That's He's somebody. purchased... Uh, this one and this one here. Okay. So, so the trick is to try to mimic yeah. the natural overland flow. Right. And, um, well, I'm just thinking of flooding. Yeah, like it's, whoever's it's property is with a garage and then how close that stone wall obviously has to be in from the property line somewhat. So it's a couple feet in. Yeah, okay. But yeah, because basically um, water will only go in sheet flow for a fairly yep. short distance on a slope like that. Yep. Then you get a bunch of little mini rivulets. Yep. You know, just little. The thing is, is that when you do something like that, and you're bringing the water to one place, and now you try to take that water and then spread it out again, that is. Um, I, mean, I mean, that's not a bad way to try to do it. Yep. It's just I think the first time out, it's, you're going to have to watch it. Right. I mean, that's. Um, it's going to be a process to kind of get mm -hmm. it to work the way you want it. Um, you really want to spread it out as much as possible. Um, it goes over that property line now, yeah. so you're basically trying to mimic that, and that's the goal. Yeah. What's the flow? Like which which direction? I can't even see the lines from here. Which direction? Once it gets past that wall, what general direction is it? Is it going towards the road? Across. Okay. The church is over in here. Yeah. So yeah. it'll just continue across the road on this okay. driveway. Some of it will go down the, right down the street. It's, it's okay. all about the speed and yeah. all about the concentration of it. If you can yeah. get it to disperse, then you lose its energy. But it's really, it's easier to show something like that. It's harder to get it to work that way. True. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we trust Dave and his crew, right, Dave? Yeah. We'll do it. And there's, you know, it, it, that's a, that type of design is actually a pretty good place to start. I, I don't, I don't have a big issue with that, uh, but. Okay. Definitely need to kind of figure out, and when you're out in the field, to get it to work the way you want it to. So um, appreciate the comments. Anything else as far as um, issues that we need to address? With, with I don't have anything that we left outstanding, other okay. than that we're waiting on the confirmation back yep. from Graves. Okay. So at this point, I'd like to open it up to the public. Uh, if you have any comments or you'd like to add anything to this conversation or questions, please come on up, give your name and address, and let us know what you're thinking. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is Daniel Vallone, V-E-L-L-O-N-E. -L -L -E. I reside at 51 Church Street, submitted comments earlier today. Uh, the comments I submitted earlier this evening, or earlier this afternoon rather, uh, have been provided as a follow-up to written comments provided April 2nd to the Commission, written comments uh, provided to the Commission April 16th, and then uh, specifically the packet of information I provided to the uh, Planning Board last evening as a follow-up to a, a uh, discussion that was held at the uh, uh, planning board meeting on April 22nd. Um, specifically, I have a concern with the design of the infiltration basin one and two on the western extent of the property. And Leah, if you could uh, bring up drawing sheet C1.02, please, or, or either one will work. All right, so uh, yeah, so uh, drawing sheet C102 shows the existing conditions, shows the locations of the test pits that were performed back in August of 2018, shows the staked boring locations of the borings that were performed in February of 2019. Um, it was um, asserted earlier by the chair that the soils on site are C-type soils. However, that is not the case for the soils 
uh, in this polygon here. specifically the location of test pits 8 and test pits 10, exactly where the stormwater detention basin 1 and 2 are going to be located. Now, if you were to review the test pit logs that were submitted as part of the soil evaluator assessment, you'll note that um, many of the conditions documented uh, were variable. Those uh, test pit logs, incidentally, are part of Exhibit 6 that were submitted as part of the bracket. Um, design package. And uh, so uh, across the entire project development, it indicates groundwater was variable. Estimated depth to high groundwater was variable. Um, specifically, however, when you look at the, um, the soil properties in those test pits, uh, what you'll see is that the uh, information that's presented along with um, the Natural Resources Conservation Service Design Manual, uh, NEH 630, uh, Part 630, Hydrology, supports that the design of these soils is actually a type D soil. And that's what's outlined in the packet that I provided to the Planning Board last evening at the Board's request so that they could provide that information to Graves Engineering. So I don't want to get too far into the weeds on this, but there are three different criteria at which you would assess um, soil to evaluate um, what uh, hydrologic soil group it would fall into. If you look at the typical pedon for a uh, Paxton soil, if you look at that typical soil profile, it actually shows that the saturated hydro hydraulic conductivity of that soil ranges from 0 0.0 to 0 0.14 uh, inches per hour of infiltration. That typical range for that soil falls distinctly within the classification of soil, uh, hydrologic soil D. Now, what I did in the packet that I provided the Conservation Commission as well as the Planning Board is in calculating the saturated hydraulic conductivity, I isolated within a horizon of 24 to 100 inches. And the reason I uh, looked at that dominant property is because the soil evaluator test pits at test pits 10 and 8 in the location of those two detention basins show a CD class soil or a densic C horizon at that uh, elevation at about 24 inches. Uh, now I say at, at about um, because uh, to be exact, at test pit 8 it was 28 inches, at test pit 10 it was 30 inches. Um, again, these are test pits 8 and 10 here. This is test pit 7 and this is test pit 9. Test pit 7 and 9 both show 24 inches. So I kind of took an average of those four test pits, um, the two, uh, 8 and 10, that are in the immediate vicinity of the detention basin, and then the two that flank either side. I took an average, and I said, well, let's look at what the saturated hydraulic conductivity is of that soil at that depth range, isolating that densic layer of 24 to 100 inches. Um, the number that was calculated, and bear with me a minute because I don't want to misspeak, is uh, 0 0.5760, um, so it falls squarely within that. C can you just say that number again? I want to make sure I know where the zeros were in the point. Yep, uh, it's actually page five of my letter. Okay. It's 0 0.5760 micrometers per second. Okay. I, again, for reference, for hydrologic soil group D, it's equal to or less than 0 0.14 inches per hour okay. or 1.0 micrometers per second. So we're about a half, just over half, of what that soil should be. So in essence, what was done for the soil suitability assessment on this side was the soil evaluator did 11 test pits across the property and said these soils are typical, or, or what we saw in the field is typical of what the Natural Resources Conservation Service has published on their webpage. However, what was taken on the webpage was not used appropriately. And the reason I can make that statement definitively, 
as I've disclosed previously in front of the commission as well as in front of the planning board, is that I'm the Northeast Regional Geologist for the Natural Resources Conservation Service. I am a career federal employee. I manage the geology program for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for that federal agency as well as throughout all of New England. My primary job every day is to either develop this design data for our engineers to design or work with private engineers who are working with private landowners to develop this design data for the purposes of either designing uh, waste storage impoundments or detention basins for waste storage or designing um, irrigation ponds for the purposes of retaining water for irrigation. So while it's not a stormwater infiltration basin per se, it's detention. So you're looking at the same soil properties as what I'm getting at. In Exhibit 6 uh, of the applicant's package, it outlines that the design is based upon a hydrologic soil group C, and the primary purpose of this is to infiltrate. With that densic layer at 24 inches, it's my opinion, and again, to be clear, not representing the U.S. government or my agency, but my personal professional opinion as an abutting landowner, is that that design value is incorrect. Because, and I've provided the supporting docu documentation to the planning board and now to you folks this evening for your consideration. If that design value is correct, then these basins cannot function as intended as designed. If they can't function as intended as designed, they will not infiltrate water to the capacity that's intended as per design. And an additional volume of water will then pass out of that basin. My concern with that is then when you look at the rock plunge pool, and if you'll bear with me one second, I can tell you the drawing sheet. Leah, could you uh, queue up C3.02, please? This is the grading and drainage plan. So the rock plunge pool located here in the southwest corner is shown at a grade of six feet below the existing grade. And there's no detail in these, the engineering submittal to detail what this rock plunge pool looks like. So if these basins, and I'm gonna focus on basin two for the moment, if basin two does not infiltrate to the design capacity that's anticipated based upon the hydrologic soil group, it will pass a greater volume of water. We've discussed briefly some of those flow velocities coming out of these basins relative to basin one. But the same thing that will happen through this rock chute coming out of basin two to that plunge pool, you'll have higher velocities. You could potentially jump the berm and not diffuse through the level spreader, okay? Or you could overtop the basin from the side and get erosion down the side of the regraded slope. Now, I've had a limited, uh, limited availability to look at um, the geotechnical soil borings. Um, and I want to uh, uh, say uh, a word of appreciation to the applicant and his engineer for um, releasing that information. Leah just emailed it to me earlier today. But um, as I noted on that earlier sheet, there were three soil borings that had been conducted um, along that western margin of the property downslope of these two potential design basins. Those borings were conducted originally for the purposes of looking at a proposed access roadway there. However, that still provides useful geotechnical information. Mind you, the geotechnical information looked at a geotechnical, by a geotechnical engineer is different than the interpretation and the analysis by a soil evaluator. But in theory, they, if everybody's doing their job right, right, it all should come out to the same. Right? Should, if everybody's it, looking yeah. at things apples to apples. Fortunately, in this instance, the soil evaluator, again, just to recap, uh, test pit seven upslope of the detention basins, 24 inches. Test pit nine downslope of the detention basin, 24 inches to that densic layer. Test pit eight and 10 in the um, location of the detention basins, 28 and 30 inches. The geotechnical borings show um, densic glacial till at two feet in um, test boring NEG1 and Densic uh, Glacial Till Soil at approximately two feet. They have two plus or minus feet at uh, NEG2. And then at NEG3, and again, I've only briefly looked at this. Um, I believe it's a little deeper, and I think NEG3 is to the southern end of the property. Um, 
but that is at, um, at four to six feet. They have dense glacial till. The point of this is that the geotechnical borings show dense glacial till. The soil evaluator test pits show a densic layer at 24 inches, and based upon the properties of the web soil survey for these site conditions, it actually classifies as a hydrologic soil group D. In that specific location, that's it's uh, soil unit 305C of the Paxton Formation, exactly where those detention basins are located. Based on that information, it's my opinion that those two infiltration basins will not function as intended by design. Now, it's my understanding, um, Wayne noted tonight, that they ran some calculations and they looked at what the basin would be without any infiltration and everything still works and it's thumbs up, yay. If that's true, then I believe the applicant should, in due diligence, submit re revised calculations for Graves Engineering to look at to substantiate all this. Um, alternately, Graves Engineering is currently looking at the information that I provided to the planning board uh, last night. Um, alternately, Graves Engineering may have some additional comments of their own. Uh, however, um, doing this every day using the web soil survey and using NEH part 630 for uh, the assignment of these hydrologic soil groups, it's my opinion that that classification at this particular location at that polygon is not representative. And again, I've outlined that in pretty significant detail in that letter um, so that you guys would have everything that I see. And so the applicant would have what I see so they could revise their, their design. So I, I don't obviously disagree with anything that you're saying. I mean, from my perspective, looking at it from a, from a design perspective and from a regulatory perspective, there's two components that we need to look at. One is um, uh, the mitigation of rate. So that's really the volume of the basin. So um, I think previously the applicant has indicated that um, if you run it with no exfiltration, which is whenever I get to a C or D soil, I usually do no exfiltration because it has no significant impact on the reduction of rate. It, it's, it's, it, it just for me is, is, it's more conservative. It's just an easy way to show that, okay, that's not doing it. So that's kind of one component of it is, is mitigating the rate based on detaining a certain volume. The other part of it is a regulatory one where, um, where, uh, the Wetlands Protection Act and its regulations require so much recharge. And that's, as you probably know, is a sliding scale based upon the soils and based upon the soils group, basically. And I'm not going to know these numbers off the top of my head. I know it's 0. 0.6 for A soil. So, and it goes down, I forget, D soil is. D? Yeah. B? D. Oh. It, it's, the, the thing is, is, so there's two components of this, is just to make sure that the volume of the basin is adequate so that what is going uh, exiting the basin and going into the plunge pool is within the parameters of the design intent. That's one that I think they're probably looked at, but I think um, that's a fairly easy exercise. The second part is if it is a D soil, you're going to have a little bit more trouble getting your recharge volume. However, you flip that. Is, is to then say, if it is a D soil, you actually have to recharge less. So, it, it, so from my perspective, from a you know, regulatory standpoint, um, I'm not gonna sit here and argue about the soils, because um, you know, basically, if it, you know, as a professional, this is what you look at. When I look at soils and I look at the soils maps and so forth, I look at it from a very different perspective. And, and, you know, and use it in those ways in understanding the impacts and so forth. Um, so the other thing that, and this is something we would ask Graves um, as our peer reviewer, is to kind of make a, a, a general determination based on the information that he has. Is, is it C or D? Because sure. bottom line is big picture, you want to make sure that volume is there so you mitigate the rate. And I think that's an easy exercise to demonstrate that. And it's good to have that in. The D soil is a little bit like, it's hard to, um, you know, when you're looking at a site and having talked to a lot of folks who have worked f 
in the past for you know doing soil, actually doing the soil maps and, and how it's done and understanding that um, through a series of analysis, you kind of create the map units. They're never perfect. I mean, it's, it's you know, there's, it's amazing how much work is done actually to create those, but it's never going to be um, exact, and especially when you're talking a C to D soil and you're talking, you know, glacial till, you're going to have that range. May I interject? Yes. So that is exactly why it's essential to do on-site testing. Right. And the information submitted from on-site testing, I think, um, could maybe have presented a little more complete information since some of the information was presented as variable. Yeah. Um, I think at this point, the perception, the public perception would be at least if you go back and now fill in those numbers, since that work was done in August of 2018, if those numbers were to be filled in today and say, well, it's not variable, these are actually what it is, it looks a little suspicious why actual numbers weren't provided back in August of 2018. But I think the intent is because you're looking at a typical soil pet on and because you're trying to develop some typical soil profiles and behavior, engineering behavior, uh, for an entire soil group, that makes doing the on-site classification that much more essential. essential. Uh, in which case, we do have on-site data. We have three geotechnical borings downslope that shows densic material. We have um, test pits immediately in the vicinity of the detention basins, as well as upslope and downslope, which all show relatively um, uniform uh, depth to densic material. So uh, I understand the balance between the regulatory requirements and the design requirements. It's quite plausible that the engineer can design for this condition. To uh, substantiate that, I believe they should be resubmitting that information then to meet that requirement. Um, and, and the reason for that, the concern is that, again, if they can't infiltrate that volume, then maybe they're not meeting their recharge needs, um, or maybe they're going to pass a greater volume of water to Church Street down that slope since they're regrading the slope. So, and I don't disagree with that. I mean, it's, it's basically you take a, an approach um, looking at uh, typical TR20, the, the, the programs you use, the models you use, are, are, are conservative, and they're conservative for a reason. And that is, there's a lot of variability. It also has to do with the, the methods that it's done, and we don't, we don't need to get into the history of TR20 at this point, but it's, it's, um, it has a long, um, it, there's a lot of experience with it, and we know that it is tends to be conservative, and, and you tend to get a little bit oversized. I'm not saying that should cover this, but that's one of the reasons it does that. It's also in Caracol, and there's a lot of other things going on there. I would, at this point, just kind of give it back to the applicant as far as you've heard um, this information. I know that you've already looked at some things, but and we still have kind of the final round with Graves if there's anything that you'd like to do or, or, or say at this point, so. No, I think we've, Madam Chair, I think we've met uh, requirements uh, under the state regulations in designing the, the stormwater uh, system. Um, in looking at the uh, soil evaluator mm -hmm. forms, um, they're completed to the level that they're typically completed by any engineer or soil evaluator that, that prepares them. Um, and I do appreciate um, Mr. Vallone's uh, expertise uh, in this, but I think we made it clear earlier, we're not looking to infiltrate, you know, we can take that off the table. So I think, with all due respect, Mr. Vallone, I think, you know, um, with that, I think we can just move on regarding the soils. So I know this, is, this information is gonna go to Graves, so he has yep. the opportunity we rely on our peer reviewer for, for this information and so forth. You know, I appreciate taking the effort to do this. I'll probably read through all your stuff and learn something from it, but I look at it kind of the big picture to make sure that we're meeting the regulatory requirements. And what I'm hearing here is the difference between it being a C and a D. Um, from a regulatory standpoint, that has an impact, but you and know, it's, can it's, I ask yeah. you, can you say definitively that the impact will be negligible to the 
to the point where it won't impact the abutting neighbors or the traveling public on Church Street? Um, I'm not going to say that. Our peer review will say that. Okay. So, but but yeah, but I think did, I just a question. Did you have to give Graves the information about? Uh, with no infiltration. I ran that this afternoon. I can provide that to them. I, I as think that would be helpful tomorrow. to send that to the peer reviewer. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, just a, a quick cover letter. Not you've already done it, and that to me is is where um, where the model it will help to substantiate that component of it. Sure. So if the model does in fact substantiate that, then that would be a different condition than is documented in their stormwater design report. Yeah. Exhibit 6, at which case, just to make sure that all of the town's I's are dotted and the T's crossed, it would make sense then to request a resubmittal so that the design documents match the design analysis. In right. the event, just to finish my thought, yeah. in the event that there should ever be a failure and that anyone should have to come back and look at this, it would be inconclusive as to the why the town would permit something to go through if the design doesn't match the supporting information. So I, I would agree on the fact that documenting this, which is one through the public process here. Second, appreciate the, the documents uh, as I, I don't know if you were here when I suggested for people, go ahead and put it in a letter and send it to us because it ends up in our record. If the applicant uh, sends over an updated HydroCAD uh, run that shows no exfiltration, that becomes part of the record too. Of course, so as, as long as the transmittal sufficiently outlines the changes that they're making. I mean, this is all standard engineering practice. Yep. Yep. Um, y yeah, and that is not to my satisfaction. That's obviously to the town's satisfaction, but in my official capacity, if I were to see something like that, I would agree. I would say, well, yes, we've made the changes. We have a written yep. record of it. And I can't tell you, not having seen the information, if there's any other changes, and I know what my experience is on things like this, it's amazing when you can do nine out of 10 things and it doesn't have any impact, but you run that one time. It's just something to check. So if you would send that, I think that would clear this up. We will. And then the whole idea of, you know, the difference, you know, if we were talking the difference between A and a C or B and a C, that has a little bit more impacts, but the difference between C and D, um, it does still have impacts, no question about it. It's not as significant, as you know, because you work with this all the time, all you have to do is look at the numbers between what an A, high A is, and what a D is, and it's just, I mean, you know, the, the change is, is significant as opposed to going from a, a C to a D. However, it's of still course. a change. If I were to buy a Porsche or if I were to buy a Mazda, I would be expecting to pay a lot more money if I were to buy a Porsche. Right. So yeah. it's understood that the hydraulic conductivity of an A would be much variable, yeah. uh, much more variable in contrast to a D, because you're looking at two opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, I did want to call the board's attention to the fact, and this is kind of separate from the soils data, but uh, based on the soils data, one of the um, one of the features of the web soil survey is that it talks about or it gives you a rating in terms of um, subsurface water management, right? right? And so we're getting into the weeds with all the technical stuff and I you know we could do this for hours probably the group of us um, talking about these soil properties but what it what it distills down to is you can plot off an area and so this is the packet that was submitted to the planning board that the applicant now has a copy of and what I submitted earlier to the board but but you can draw an area so I've defined an area here a rectangular grid and um, you could see Bruce Hollow here too and Here's Church Street, and then that's that same soil polygon that we were just discussing, the 305C soils. Um, and so you can draw this area, and then you could look at what is the subsurface water management system performance. And the color on this figure is all red. And what all red means is for that entire soil group that um, it's to have very limited soil performance. And that's you know, further enumerated here as to why densic layer and slow moving water are the principal components. Um, and basically it goes on to say that it indicates the extent to which the soils are limited by all of the soil features that affect the specific use. Very limited indicates that the soil has one or more features that are unfavorable for the specified use. And the limitations generally cannot be overcome without major soil reclamation, special design or, or expensive installation procedures. Poor performance can be expected. So 
The information that I'm providing is for the applicant's benefit as much as it is for the commission so that they can anticipate that poor performance can be expected to quote from what I'm reading here. Um, and that also expensive installation could be a potential. And again, it's depending upon and having you know read through some of the more backup stuff for the soils and you got to get into when they were written um how well, much this they is current i printed this off just the no, other no, day no i understand that but the descriptions and when you look at look at the soils um the different soils classifications and, and kind of constraints some of those descriptions are dated and, and so forth i'm not saying it's not current mm -hmm. it's also the difference between um you know it's like, I guess what I'm hearing from the applicant is that they already anticipate that it is poor, you know, poor to very poor soils based on a pure infiltration component. There's a lot of other things with erosive and, and you can get into different things during construction about when you have that high silt content and you have this till material, it can be, uh, it can be very difficult. It gets wet because it kind of, not totally, but sort of liquefies. You get that mm -hmm. nice slurry, and it's it, it can play havoc on a construction site. The latency. Yeah. That's, that's the physical property you're describing. Yeah. And, and I appreciate the chair's knowledge of all this information. Um, all we have at this point is what the applicant's engineering representative yeah. has told us verbally. There's been nothing submitted to the commission or to the planning board. Which is, which is why I asked that question about the follow-up on looking sure. at that. I mean, I've... A lot of the concerns I have about the site um, have not that it has more to do with, you know, the actual construction and an erosion potential on the site. That's a big concern for me. Um, yeah, this is this is New England, as you well know. This is not an uncommon soil complex out here. This is. I'm not going to say common, but it's it's not uncommon at all to hit Paxton and, and this type of till material. However, generally, infiltration basins are not designed right. in those soils, and they're not documented as a soil C when the information substantiates a different soil class. I'm yeah. reminded of a cartoon that I have hanging in my office, and that cartoon is of um, engineers presenting the schematics for the Eiffel Tower. And the Eiffel Tower is, or excuse me, the Eiffel Tower, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, rather. And the Leaning Tower of Pisa is shown vertically on their illustration. And at the bottom, it says, we can save 100 lira by eliminating soil tests. Yeah. The, uh, the suggestion there is by not looking at appropriate soils data, you can sometimes overlook the information. What, everything that I've seen in the soils data and the, the documentation that I've provided substantiates a different soil class. And I understand that the applicant's engineering firm has gone through their process already, and they are satisfied with that information. And at that point, we can disagree. Um, however, it's now the Conservation Commission and the Planning Board and Graves Engineering as mm -hmm. the consultant for the town to evaluate what is here. And all that I am requesting is that that appropriate evaluation be done and that those considerations be given. And I appreciate that. I mean, it's, it's you know, so you want to be on the Conservation Commission? As soon as I get done uh, coaching soccer, youth soccer. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry to, to, to kind of <laughs> just, just, just putting it out there. My, I my mean. name is not on the planning board as a write-in as a write-in candidate. Let's yeah, no, it it's, 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 a, it's a, just a set of knowledge. But again, and, and then um, I do have the experience of kind of understanding of, you know, you know, the definition of an engineer is, is different than a scientist. And that's because we use what scientists produce. Sure. And then we implement that. So it's, it's kind of the two kind of professions working together and understanding the boundaries of each one, but also the overlapping. And, and, and I couldn't appreciate that more because my undergraduate degree is in science and my graduate degree is in civil engineering, focusing on geotechnical engineering and geohydrology. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's that, yeah, it's, it's that you know. marriage. And yep. whenever I speak to engineers, I say, no, 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 don't worry. Half my brain is engineer. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, no. So I appreciate that. And I think our, already through the planning board, this information will get to Graves and, and we'll follow up that. And I appreciate the applicant also following up with some information. Um, we do. We need to go through and make sure we documented it. At this point, we're just waiting for Graves' response back. Mm -hmm. So I think it's an opportunity to get this in there before we get that response letter. 
so that we can all be on the same page. Absolutely. And, so. and I, I would assume Graves Engineering will receive the test pit or the uh, soil boring logs, rather, because they were just submitted to the town May 6th, I believe was the date. Yeah, we'll make sure. I mean, it's part of, it's part of the package. Uh, we'll, uh, it's great the town does everything um, paperless now. It's all electronic. So all of that information is readily available well, to both our peer reviewer but also to the public. So. Un understood. However, they were submitted to the town on May 6th, the email date, and yep. they s have not yet to this date been uploaded as an exhibit on the Planning Board's website. Okay. So that might be something that the Commission would be interested yep. in following up with the Planning Board on to make sure that gets done. We'll take care of us. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's. I mean, obviously, Leah works in the same office with the, the planner and, and so forth. Sure. It's, it is a. It's good. It's one. To, it's, I, I know, you know when Wayne emailed it. In, you know, in the signature, he did send it to Joe as well. So I know they have it. Um, right. It just hasn't been uploaded yet. Okay. Yeah. That's. You know. Uh, but yeah. But I think um, that's an important. We're very big on just conducting it through the public process to make sure it's transparent, but also having the information on on the website and having it access is, is also makes it good for all these citizens also so sure so I appreciate it and thanks for the information and we'll follow up on that and um, I don't know if the if you have anything more to add and N not at this time okay. I'll reserve the right to have a comment at a future meeting though uh, that's Quick that's your her. that's your right go yes. ahead um so obviously a lot of this stuff is uh, I do not have an engineering degree so. <laughs> But you stayed at a Holiday Inn last night. Yes, yeah. that's right. <laughs> Mine was material engineering, so it's a little bit different. Um, so I, I appreciate the information that, you know, obviously, your expertise that you, you've brought, provided to us um, and understanding the difference between the C and the D soils. Um, and we just got your letter, so I haven't had a chance to kind of go through it and sure. you know, grasp everything that you said. Do you have anything in there or anything along those lines to kind of predict – Hey, because it's a D soil, not a C, this is the difference of what, what we can expect during a you know hundred year storm. Are we talking, you know, the faucet was left on, or are we talking it's gonna turn into the Grand Canyon? Like where what kind of expectations should we have that 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 you're seeing sure. based on your expertise that this basin is not gonna be able to hold this this amount of water? I, I understand your question and I appreciate it. Um, that level of detail is not in my letter for a specific reason which has nothing to do with this project and that is although half my brain is engineer and my academic training is in engineering my occupational series for the government is as a scientist and so um, not to get into politics too much right but there are certain protections afforded to you as an employee of the federal government operating as an employee of the federal government uh, the government being the responsible party if I were to make a mistake, if I am operating within my occupational series. Because my job for the government is coded as a scientist, if I were to do anything that is perceived as engineering for the government, then I would not be afforded those protections under the Federal Supremacy Act um, because I was practicing engineering. So it's a fine line that I walk every day, and I advise our engineers, I advise the engineers working with the public as to how I interpret things, um, but I don't ever put that in writing. I don't ever, uh, I can't practice engineering in that regard. Gotcha. Um, I am also not licensed professionally in this state as an engineer. I'm licensed professionally in several states as a geologist. So I can practice geology. I cannot practice engineering ethically, but I have the academic training and so I can apply that. Um, in terms of the impact, these kind of designs, and I'm sure Wayne can elaborate more on this or the chair, um, they're so sensitive to the model. I mean, modern advances in engineering, we don't do hand calculations anymore. Everything is numerical analyses. And most of the time, whenever we're inputting a soil parameter or a design parameter, we'll do a sensitivity analysis to say, how will, what, and that's essentially what Wayne did today, right? Um, how will, what will the impact to the design be if I tweak it this way or if I tweak it that way? And those nuances can sometimes be so minute that I couldn't begin to speculate. The overall concern, though, is that if infiltration is less than the design, you're not losing the water where you want to be losing it, and so you have to pass that water somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And depending on those design storm events, and there's several different design storm events that have been in ex submitted as part of Exhibit 6, um, depending on those design storm events, that impact can, can grow. 
Um, and I, I won't say that it'll grow exponentially, but there's a difference between a one-year storm and a five-year storm and a hundred-year storm. And that's the, the benefit of modern engineering to be able to run those analyses very quickly. And that is the intent of asking that the town have the I's dotted and the T's crossed to make sure all those numbers work out properly for the purposes of not passing that water, not creating surface erosion to the west of the infiltration basin down slope, mm -hmm. and not having that volume of water uh, affect Church Street. Sure. And it was a few weeks ago um, after a planning board meeting, um, you know, we all passed each other in the hallway and we were kind of talking about my driveway, which is this common driveway right here, mm -hmm. and what volumes of water do we see? And there's a catch basin right here. That's a utility pole. There's a catch basin right there. So currently, all the volume of water coming off Church Street from one of the higher catch basins, that, whatever that segment is, is maintained, it's contained by that particular catch basin. The concern as a resident with access to this driveway is if there's a deeper or a greater volume of water than anticipated, you're gonna have sheet flow down the road once it makes its way to the road, and that catch basin may not have the capacity to, to handle it all. Now, in that, private or off the record conversation that I had with Wayne and the applicant, um, there was discussions of, did you talk to the town about this kind of grate and that kind of grate and modifications that can be done to that catch basin? And that is well beyond my knowledge base. Um, and maybe there are things that the applicant could propose to the town that would be of a benefit to the town, but that's beyond my expertise. Yeah, it's the same, same reason as, even though I am licensed in this state, uh, when I'm acting on this commission, I'm um, a, a volunteer and a citizen, and I'm not going to uh, give any professional opinions. Uh, you know, something like that. That's what we have peer review from. My my stamp is covered by my company. I'm not crossing that line. That's right. pretty basic, um, but I will bring some of the you know information I have. But I'm not going to. Oh, and you asked me about. Will it not? I'm not going to make that determination. Sure. I have not done the peer review. I have not done the detail analysis. I can look at things and understand where it's going, but I rely on our peer reviewer. So that's kind of where this belongs. So that, yeah. And so I, I hope I was able to answer your question without exactly answering your question. No, I appreciate it. I'm yeah. sure. just trying to understand it better. Yeah. All right. So thank you very much. Thank you again for the opportunity to present. Yep. Always good to see everybody. Yep. Thank this you. is, thank yeah. You, and think about getting on the commission. <laughs> Anyone else here live in Grafton that wants to become, get on the commission, let me know. Um, so as far as that goes, anything else, Lee? I think we just, I think we're very, um, I think we're, we're close to getting things resolved. I think there's a few missing items here that we need to, to close the loop on. Um, and I think the next thing, um, maybe what we can work on next is, is having some preliminary, knowing that we're waiting for graves, but also for the next meeting maybe to make it productive is maybe have some uh, draft conditions um, because, um, you know, just for to review as so everything comes out, then we can kind of move ahead. Mm -hmm. um, I actually of, already have that. Yeah, I know you I know you, you emailed it to me, correct? Mm, no. Oh, you haven't? Okay. It's in so, Dropbox. Okay. So we'll, we'll take a look at some of those conditions um, and so that that can be discussed, you know, if everything moves forward, and obviously getting our final peer review completed, mm -hmm. that's kind of the next step. So we can definitely look at that. So, so we'll right. save that till next time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Any other questions or? So that's kind of. So hopefully, no offense, we only see you one more time. Uh, no, unless anything else comes up. You folks. Yeah. No, it's, no, but it's a process. <laughs> Appreciate the process. Yeah. I appreciate the abutters, you know, contributing and um, the fact that you're actually going to reach out and help one of the, the neighbors is also not a bad thing. So no, appreciate no. that. Thank you. Okay. And we have a gravel wetland. N yeah, and, and <laughs> I'd like to my get my baby. I, I'd love to get uh, you know the abutters kind of um, opinion of a gravel wetland, and because it's it's interesting the soils component of that. It's, I'll tell you, Madam Chair, when my my baby is born, I'll get some photos for the commission. Absolutely, it will okay. definitely be we'll, taking some photos of yeah, that. We'll show you as as it's sh it's progressing through the yep. first it year. Just, and, you know, just yeah. got to follow through and and kind of um, close all the the kind of open things that we have yep. uh, and keep on going in the right direction. So sounds good. All right, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you.
No, you I'm just checking. No one else had any comments on this. So the date. next thing is is obviously, are you going to request a continuance? I was going to say so moved because I sit on a board myself, but I, I can't say <laughs> that. Uh, uh, yes, please. And, and then the next meeting is 618. June 18th. June 18th. June 18th. Okay. So do I have a motion? I'll make a motion that we continue this hearing until June 18th. Uh, second. All those in favor? Okay. Thank you, folks. Yep. Much appreciated. All right. Does anyone else, anyone else here for anything else? Music to my ears. So, next motion. Make a motion that we close this meeting. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. <laughs>